Science is the emblematic feature of the country of Germany. Countless German scientists, scholars, and academics pursued their dream of discovering the hidden truths about the world and space, making the most important discoveries for the world and human history. Enjoying the benefits of modern life, a great appreciativeness must be given to the hard dedication of the German brain. As you will discover through the following facts, Germany holds the merits for generating critical theories, explanations, and inventions that led to the development of technologies, treatments, structures, and models that made human life easier and cheerier. Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button and press the bell icon for more informative and amazing videos. In this video, we will discuss German scientist Fritz Haber, the most eminent scientist of Germany and his priceless scientific contribution given to the world we live in. Let's get started. Fritz Haber born to a German-Jewish family in Breslau, Haber received his early education at the local gymnasium. Influenced in part by his father's occupation as a successful importer of natural dyes and pigments, he began his study of chemistry at the University of Berlin in 1886, but he transferred to Heidelberg after a single semester. After only a year and a half at Heidelberg, Haber's university career was interrupted by a year of military service. He then transferred to the Charlenburg Technische Hochschule in Berlin, where he worked under Karl Liebermann on the organic compound Pipronel. Charlenburg did not grant doctoral degrees, so he received his doctorate from the University of Berlin in 1891 for his work with Liebermann. Graduation was followed by three years of unrest, characterized by brief periods of industrial employment, including working for his father interspersed with short bouts of postdoctoral study at the Technische Hochschule in Zurich and the University of Jena. Haber married Clara Merwar, a fellow chemist in 1901, they had a son Hermann. Clara opposed his work on poison gas and tragically committed suicide with his service revolver in their garden in 1915. He then married for the second time in 1917 to Charlotte Nathan they had two children, a son and a daughter. The couple divorced in 1927. Herman's wife Margaret died after the end of World War II, and Herman committed suicide in 1904-6. Herman's oldest daughter committed suicide in 1949, also a chemist. In 1894 Haber was appointed as an assistant in the Department of Chemical and Fuel Technology at the Friedrichen at Technische Hochschule in Karlsruhe. Here he rapidly worked his way through the academic ranks to become a full professor in 1906. Haber remained at Karlsruhe until 1911, when he was called to head the newly founded Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physical Chemistry and Electrochemistry in the Berlin suburb of Dahlem. He directed the institute until early 1933, when he resigned in protest over the newly enacted Nazi race laws. This was followed by four months of exile in England, where he worked in the laboratory of William Pope at the University of Cambridge. He died of a massive heart attack a few months later in Basel, Switzerland, while en route to Palestine to discuss the prospects for a position with the Daniel Sieff Research Institute, founded at Rehavat in 1934 by Ching Wiseman, who became the first president of Israel in 1949. Though originally trained as an organic chemist, Haber switched to the field of physical chemistry after his appointment at Karlsruhe. In keeping with the school's engineering emphasis, his work became heavily oriented toward industrial applications. Indeed, this became the central theme of his entire research career, the elucidation and development of basic industrial processes through the application of rigorous theory. His initial work involved the physical chemistry of flames and combustion, which led to his first book, Experimental Intersechungen über Zerstetzung und Verbrennung von Kohlenwasserstoffen, Experimental Investigations on the Decomposition and Combustion of Hydrocarbons. In addition to serving as a habilitation thesis for his promotion to private dozen, this work would later prove valuable in elucidating the chemistry behind the refining and cracking of petroleum. Beginning about 1897, Haber added interest in the theory and industrial applications of electrochemistry to his growing list of research themes. One result of his intensive efforts to master the literature in this field was his second book, Rundrister Technischen Elektrochemie auf Theoretischer Grundlage in 1898, The Theoretical Basis of Technical Electrochemistry. His contributions in this area include his studies of the electrochemical preparation of several important organic compounds such as nitrobenzene in 1904, his study of the hydrogen-oxygen fuel cell in 1907, 
and his pioneering work on the glass electrode in 1909. Work on nitrobenzene led to a second book on electrochemistry, Die Elektrolytischen Prozess der Organischen Chemie 1910. The Electrolytic Processes of Organic Chemistry, written in collaboration with German chemist Alexander Moser. Work on the glass electrode formed the basis for the later development of the pH meter, which measures hydrogen ion concentration or acidity in pH units as a function of electrical potential or voltage between suitable electrodes placed in the solution to be tested. In 1904 Haber added yet a third research theme in the form of a growing interest in the thermodynamics of gas reactions. Here again, its preliminary survey of the literature resulted in a book, Thermodynamic Technische Gesrechtschen in 1905, The Thermodynamics of Technical Gas Reactions. His work in this area soon focused on the synthesis of ammonia gas from nitrogen and hydrogen gas and its potential as a method of nitrogen fixation. In 1898, the British chemist William Crookes warned that the world's population would soon outstrip its food production unless crop yields were increased through the use of nitrogen fertilizers. Though the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen by volume, this nitrogen is unavailable to plants unless it is first fixed in the form of a water-soluble compound such as ammonia or various nitrates. By 1908, Haber was able to show that the use of high pressures in combination with a suitable catalyst made ammonia synthesis practical, and the next year the process was turned over to the German chemist Karl Bosch at Bass Action Jessel's Chat for the industrial development of what is now known as the Haber-Bosch process. In 1911, the first ammonia plant was built at Ludwig Schaffenopau, which produced over 30 tons of fixed nitrogen per day by 1913. In 1918, Haber was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for his role in ammonia synthesis, and in 1931, Bosch belatedly received a Nobel Prize for his contributions as well. In 1918, Haber would be awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work in developing a method of synthesizing ammonia from nitrogen in the air, the process that enabled the production of fertilizer in quantities that revolutionized agriculture worldwide. Fritz Haber was born in Breslau, Prussia, now Rocklaw, Poland in 1868, and educated at the St. Elizabeth Classical School, where he took an early interest in chemistry. After studying at the University of Berlin, he transferred to the University of Heidelberg in 1886 and studied under the famed German chemist Robert Bunsen. Haber was ultimately appointed Professor of Physical Chemistry and Electrochemistry at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. When scientists warned that the world would not be able to produce enough food to feed its growing human population in the 20th century, he listened. Scientists knew nitrogen was crucial to plant life. They also knew the Earth's supply of usable quantities was quite limited. But Haber discovered a way to convert the nitrogen gas in the Earth's atmosphere into a compound that could be used in fertilizer. According to Vaclav Smil, a global agricultural historian at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, the Haber-Bosch process of synthesizing and manufacturing ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen and later industrialized by Karl Bosch, Haber's brother-in-law, was likely the most important technological innovation of the 20th century. It sustains the food base for the equivalent of half the world's population today. Haber, unlike his friend Albert Einstein, was a German patriot, and he willingly became a uniformed consultant to the German War Office. During World War I, he began drawing on experiments he'd done on using chlorine gases as a weapon. Finding an effective delivery system was challenging. One test resulted in the deaths of several German troops. But by 1915, defeats on the front lines heartened Haber's resolve to use gas weapons despite Hague Convention agreements prohibiting chemical agents in battle. Haber had a difficult time finding any German army commanders who would agree even to a test in the field. One general called the use of poison gas unchivalrous. Another declared that poisoning the enemy, just as one poisons rats, was repulsive. But if it meant victory, that general was willing to do what must be done. Haber, 
according to biographer Marjit Shalosi Jans, said if you want to win the war, then please, wage chemical warfare with conviction. In 1914, as director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physical Chemistry, Hafer placed his laboratory at the service of the German government, and by April of 1915, he was on the front lines in Ippers in uniform, smoking cigars and calculating the timing of what he hoped would be a lethal gas attack. Thousands of steel cylinders containing chlorine gas had been transported to German positions. There would be no launching or dropping of the gas on Allied troops. Instead, Haber calculated the best delivery system was the prevailing winds in Belgium. After weeks of waiting for ideal winds, strong enough to carry the gas away from the German troops, but not so strong they would dissipate the gas weapons before they could take effect against the enemy. The Germans released more than 168 tons of chlorine gas from nearly 6,000 canisters at sunrise on April 22. A sickly cloud, one witness told the New York Times, like a yellow low wall, began to drift toward the French trenches. The cloud settled over some 10,000 troops. More than half were believed to have died by asphyxiation within minutes. As thousands of French troops fled, Blinded and stunned, the Germans opened fire. Then, after the cloud had dissipated, they captured 2,000 prisoners of war, confiscating rifles and urging the afflicted French to lie down to die better. He has also been described as the father of chemical warfare for his work developing and deploying chlorine and other poisonous gases during World War I. Haber was awarded Wilhelm Exter Medal in 1929 by the Australian Industry Association. In 1932, he was awarded the Rumford Medal by the Royal Society for the outstanding importance of his work in physical chemistry, especially in the application of thermodynamics to chemical reactions. He was also active in the research of combustion reactions, the separation of gold from seawater, adsorption effects, electrochemistry, and free radical research. Haber remained in Germany after the war. He resigned from his position in 1933 when the National Social Power came to power in Germany. Haber left Dahlem in August 1933, staying briefly in Paris, Spain, and Switzerland. He was in feeble health during these travels. Haber specifically suffered attacks from angina. Repeated angina attacks can cause lasting damage, likely contributing to his death the next year. In 1933, during Haber's brief sojourn in England, Chain Wise Men offered him the directorship at the Sieve Research Institute, now the Wise Men Institute in Rehavat, in Mandatory Palestine. He accepted and left for the Middle East in January 1934, traveling with his half-sister, Elshaber Freyon. His ill health overpowered him, and on 29 January 1934, at the age of 65, he died of heart failure, mid-journey, in a Basel hotel. Following Haber's wishes, Haber and Clara's son Hermann arranged for Haber to be cremated and buried in Basel's Hornley Cemetery on 29 September 1934, and for Clara's remains to be removed from Dahlem and reinterred with him on 27 January 1937. So guys, that's all for today. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for informative and amazing videos. Thanks for watching.